the explosion of the reactor in Chernobyl had enormous consequences, but not the ones I think many people expect. I've followed the studies that have been done by international experts in radiation and oncology that followed the damage at Chernobyl for all the years since. The damage that was caused to people by the fallout from that worst of all nuclear power accidents has been remarkably limited. You can look at the evidence. It's all been published. It's been certified by the United Nations and the World Health Organization. What's so striking is just to go read the original World Health Organization documents and read the public health reports. Was that a shock to you? It was a complete shock to me. I mean, I there was a period where I'm reading all the Chernobyl stuff and I, I, I'm, I kind of am not believing it because it was so out of sync with what I had come to believe. Literally hundreds of thousands of people were involved in the clear-up operation. They're known as liquidators, and they got some really significant doses of radiation. Their doses are known, and their health has been studied ever since. And even in that large number of people who were very heavily irradiated, 40 or 50 people have died so far, and a few thousand may have shortened lifespans due to cancer in future decades. And there had never been any children born deformed from Chernobyl, according to the best authoritative science we've got from the United Nations. So people have substantially been fed uh, 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 an urban myth, really, about what the impacts of Chernobyl actually were. I mean, I've got books full of it. A million people dying right now or have died because of Chernobyl, and it's only 25 years ago. How many millions more will Chernobyl kill? 40% of the European landmass is radioactive. Will be for hundreds of years. In the order European to believe that more than 56 people were killed at Chernobyl, or more than the maybe 4,000 who could eventually die of cancer, in order to believe that a million people were killed by Chernobyl, which is what Greenpeace and Helen Caldicott and a number of other people claim, you have to believe there was a cover-up of just massive proportions by the World Health Organization, by the United Nations, by literally hundreds of the world's top public health experts. It's, it's so absurd of an idea. And it's exactly the same thing global warming deniers think. Hey, Ellen, what, what do you think is the motivation for the United Nations to perpetuate such an appalling cover-up? I don't know. I'm not privy to their motivations. The difference between 50 people and a million people is so extreme. I think people are confused about what they think. Well, they should uh, look at the literature. This is the most important study almost it? that's ever been done. How, how do you explain This it? is the biggest cover-up in the history of medicine. How do you explain this? And Many I of the, the tactics and the arguments that have been used by the environmental groups against nuclear power are exactly the same tactics and arguments that are used by climate skeptics. The United Nations, that's where all of this started. It was the IPCC in the United Nations said that the world's going to come to an end because of the emissions of CO2. So the cherry-picking of scientific data, the nurturing of, of, of scientists who happen to believe your ideological position, the and the production of reports which, are, which apparently are authoritative and scientific but actually are just ideological propaganda, basically. 41% of the people believe that global warming claims are exaggerated. Climate change deniers are idiots. But they're saying the same I don't thing. care about them. They, they, they are denying science. We're going back into the dark ages. How dare, how dare they deny science? Not to understand science and medicine in this day and age is more than irresponsible. How do you square these two conflicts? I can't. Then I started to look at, well, what actually is the amount of hazard that comes from nuclear waste? The first thing I found out is what people were actually doing with the nuclear waste, which is being generated all this time by every nuclear power plant, turns out to be pretty good. They just put it in this pretty simple but very workable dry cask storage and they park it out back of the parking lot and you can go there and see it. There's the nation's nuclear waste. Is it causing any problems? No. 
The other realization for me, and it took a while to get through, is that by not putting it in the ground, you've got the option to use it as fuel in fourth generation reactors. Wow, we can take this waste from the nuclear plant and recycle it into fuel, either by reprocessing or by having a new kind of reactor that uses it as fuel. Um, that looks very much like a renewable resource. <laughs> People are always talking about nuclear waste, the accumulation of nuclear waste, and I did too. I think it's around 70,000 tons have accumulated of used fuel in the United States. I thought the quantity was staggering. In fact, all the spent nuclear fuel from commercial nuclear plants in the United States could fit in a single football field if you stack the fuel rods to a height of about three meters. That's it. But of that, only a very small fraction, mainly plutonium, is long-lived. By long-lived, I mean would still be hot thousands of years from now, still be highly radioactive. Volumetrically, nuclear produces tiny amounts of waste. Uh, the entire waste production from France's 50 nuclear power stations, which produce 80% of the country's electricity, are under the floor in one room. Compare that with the billions of tons of waste produced by coal-fired power stations. It completely blows away most of the anti-nuclear arguments. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's not, nuclear waste is not an environmental issue. It's not something which, as an environmentalist, I'm concerned about. One of the most inspiring stories anywhere is the story of France. Here's a country in the early 70s that is burning oil for electricity. It doesn't have coal reserves doesn't want to be dependent on gas coming from Northern Europe and Russia. But when the oil shocks happened and the prices went up dramatically, the French realized they needed to get serious about a different source of energy. They said this is serious and it has to do with national security. So they focused on making sure that they had the best nuclear engineers and the standard design for the reactors and just roll it out. What's so significant about what the French did is that they did it so quickly. They scaled up almost exactly at the pace that we need to scale up nuclear power globally. They now have 80% of their electricity coming from nuclear. Their trains are electric powered. They have clean air. They have the cheapest energy in Europe. They're selling it to everybody else. And they are greener than green Denmark, greener than green Germany. I didn't know what French per capita carbon dioxide emissions were, which is actually the most important question to ask. The answer is they're about five tons per person per year. Germany's about 10 tons per year. So Germany has much, much higher per person emissions of carbon dioxide than neighboring France because France is nuclear and Germany is trying to get out of nuclear. When we look at nuclear, we have to understand that we're making a long-term investment. Now it's a big upfront capital cost, but these are plants that are gonna last 60, 80, maybe even 100 years. And much of the other infrastructure that's being built will last far longer than that. And when you really look at it that way, there's just really no question. It's a much more economical alternative to very expensive solar panels or very expensive wind turbines that require backup power. The current generation of reactors we're building now are third generation of reactors. This technology is much safer. But fourth generation reactors, like the integral fast reactors, can use the waste from the first three generations as fuel. The, the great philanthropist 
Bill Gates has put money and, and time into a traveling wave reactor that you basically stick in the ground and it goes through its body of fuel over a period of 60 years. You don't need to refuel it. Uh, there's a thorium reactor the same group is working on. Other fourth generation coming along with the small modular reactors. They look exactly like the kind of local power source that environmentalists uh, have increasingly been saying we should have. So there's a renaissance in reactor design that those are just the first glimpses of.